Okay, we'll start the Q&A. If you need to go early, you can raise your hand and we'll get to your question first. Uh, and then we'll go in the order on the screen after that. See, I've already got a couple hands, so let me allow you to unmute yourself. Paul and Ryan. Paul and Ryan, you have a question or comment? Hello. I, I wanted to ask you, you said in Matthew 4.4 4, that this was a quote from Deuteronomy. Do you know where that is in Deuteronomy? I want to say offhand, I think it's Deuteronomy 8. Let me see. Uh... Yes, Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3 says, He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Yeah, it's a... It, you know, that's a, that Matthew 4 is great because there are three temptations given to Jesus... And every time he quotes Deuteronomy, um, and he tells you, it is written, it is written, it is written. So it shows you the way you combat Satan's lie program is with truth. So, and Jesus demonstrated that. And that, that will apply for us today as well. That was an excellent Bible study. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate you joining. Uh, Gail Salvage, uh, not Gail Salvage, Gail Brule, I'm sorry. Gail Brule, you have a question or comment? Yeah, Eric, I just wanted to say that uh, that was such a fantastic study. And I'm going to have to go back and watch the video again because uh, it ties things together so well with what we're facing, the truth versus the lies. It's such a simple, it's, it's so simple, and yet people don't understand that it's a spiritual battle, first of all, and how, I mean, how black and white the two sides are. It's truth and lie, that's it. So I really, really appreciate this study. It ties together so much of the Bible that, um, yeah, like I said, I just need to go back over it again. Uh, but thank you very much. And I hope your throat and your your coughing and all of that is done for now and that you'll you'll feel better. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, last Friday and Saturday were just tough. But uh, ever since then, it's been getting better. So it's uh, <coughs> coughing on cue. I still have a little bit, but not much. It's almost 100%. So appreciate that. But yeah, what you said, it's... Yeah, it's, it's just so much confusion out there, uh, and it really boils down. It's simple. It's black and white. It's either truth versus lies, and a reason I think a lot of times people can't see that is because, first off, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man discerneth not the things of the Spirit of God. So a lot of times when people are looking at it, they're looking at it from a natural point of view rather than the spiritual, and what they're looking at a lot of times is a version of Satan's lie program and then a different version of Satan's lie program. I mean, there's some truth in what the Democrats say. There's some truth in what the Republicans say. But all of them have lies within it because they're not all right-dividing, Bible-believing, following Christ's word. They're following things of this world. So they end up with lies in both sides. So people think, oh, the choice is between Republicans and Democrats or, you know, the liberal versus the conservative view. But really... All of that is part of the lie program, and the choice is between the truth of God's word and then the lie program of what Satan is doing. And when you see that, then everything becomes clearer. And you can get that greater discernment. I know a lot of times in churches, like if you rightly divide the word of truth, you're a Bible believer, you can see what's going on in churches sometimes, and you can say, you can say, well, that's not of God what they're doing. But the people who are actually in the churches and are part of that, they don't see it. Because they'll say, well, their authority isn't the Bible, it's the church. And so they'll think, well, it must be of God, whatever change is being made. And so then they go right along with it. But when you understand that God's word is apart from what Satan is doing, then you can see it 
And you, it's like you've got that outside perspective of God, and you can say, oh, they're following lies here with this change in the church or whatever it is. So, yeah, it'll really clear up all the confusion, and I think that's needed a lot today considering what's going on. It's just, you know, when it says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, uh, that's what we're seeing today. Not only are they deceiving people, they are also deceiving themselves because they're just following another version of the lie program. And it seems like the U.S. now is into two different camps. You got, you know, it's, it's so divided and we're not united anymore. And it's just two sides of the same coin of Satan's lie program. So when you make the Word of God your focus, then it becomes clear and you can see what's really going on. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing how few people get it and how many people are squabbling over, you know, peanuts. Right. <laughs> because that's all it is. It's going to be burned up. And uh, it is kind of frustrating to be, to know what we know and not just not be able to to reach people because they are so steeped in Churchianity's live program. And, you know, I, I've got a lot of people that surround me in different parts of my life that are either very staunch Catholics, which, you know, I don't even try to talk to, or they're just, they're just um, connected because they like the personal thing of going to church. And they don't want to stop that, no matter if they believe or don't believe what the church's doctrine is. I mean, it's it's really bizarre. But um, anyway, I just I wanted to make sure and thank you. Uh, there's been so many messages lately. I haven't really had a chance to comment on, but so many messages lately that are pulling everything together in my mind. And uh, you know, that's the most important thing at this point is is us getting that that solidifying of the word and between the studies of you know that we started in Genesis uh, all the way through these studies it's all kind of coming together and I'm really looking forward to uh, March 30th and the um, you know I'm sure that will pull it together even more so appreciate everything you do and I hope you're feeling like really good so Thanks, Gail. Yeah, what you're seeing happening today is that we're leading up to that Antichrist. And he's going to be the political and religious and economic leader. And so you'll see more of religion coming into politics now. When Biden and Kamala Harris ran last presidential election, one of their slogans was, Battle for America's Soul. So they made politics being about a spiritual thing. Just last week, Trump came out and said he was uh, called by God to lead this country. Uh, so now, Trump is saying God's called him. Uh, Biden says it's a battle for America's soul. Uh, regardless of what side you're on and what you think about all that, the fact is they're calling upon, they're bringing that religious element into politics. And the reason is because eventually you've got that Antichrist who's going to be the one world ruler, and he's going to rule... The first half of the tribulation period through the Jewish religion and the second half through New Age or the God of Forces that he honors. And so <clears throat> he's got the Queen of Heaven, Babylon, that religious system that he's going to rule with. And so Satan is getting the world prepared for that by you see in the, the religion side uh, creeping into politics, both on the Democrat and the Republican side, so that we get used to that and we're looking for a spiritual savior who the Antichrist says he will be. So, yeah, we'll, we'll cover that more in the March 30th conference. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad everything's sort of tying together because we need that in this world. It's just so, like I said, I don't believe anything on the news anymore. It's just yeah. so much confusion. So you need something that you can trust in, God's Word, and that will ground you and get that truth in there. So that, That's about all you can believe in at this stage of the game. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. Uh, Larry Tidwell, Larry, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, I want to comment. I did beat Richard again. <laughs> and I like that mega hat you got on there, brother. <laughs> I've never gone against you, uh, Eric, but I've got to do that today. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> you said, if I understood you right, there is some truth with the Democrats. I can't believe that. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Uh, I tell you, buddy, you do such a good job. I, I'm, I'm just so thankful for you. And and um, and like Gail said, I, it, you you have a way of putting all this stuff together. It's really it's really needed, and um, really thankful for. And tell Lenny and Lisa that Mary heard, heard Lenny say that about the. It's called a butter roll, and she's going to get back on that, Lenny. So anyhow, y'all have a blessed day. Love all of you. And 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 uh, Richard, your hand is next, buddy. <laughs> all right, talk to y'all. Thank you, all of you. Love you. Thanks, Larry, and love you too. Richard, I guess it's your turn now. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, uh, yeah. That, that's that's. You know, it's very, it's more and more important for us to be grounded in God's truth. Because the lie program is ramping up. They're, they're raising the tone of the lie program. And the deception in every way in government is, is getting more and more. And we, want, we can be deceived very easily into that lie program if we don't have God's word in us. We've got to be grounded in that, in God's Word, rightly divided. We've got to know what the lies look like and what the truth looks like so we can tell the difference. But, uh, yeah, you, you, really, you really explained it very good. I, I enjoyed that. I am still voting for Trump, though. As you can see, make America godly again. It doesn't say make America great. We don't care if it's great. We want it to be godly. <laughs> But yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, it's it's more and more important that we are grounded in God's word. We got to have truth in us so we can know the lies, because the lies are very slick, very slick. Satan's not stupid. He he knows how to deceive. He's he's the father of deception. He knows it all like that. So. And I hope those people that are so billionaires and trillionaires and living in this life program, I hope they enjoy their worldly possessions and their worldly wealth and all of that stuff that goes with it. Because if they don't, if they don't trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to the atonement for their sins, that stuff is gonna, it's not going to do them any good in hell. You know, they're going to have a Eternity of torment. So I hope they enjoy it while they're here. Yeah. Anyhow, thank you, Harry. Huh. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, you bring up a good point about that deception program of Satan being so strong. Um, I meant to read it, but I didn't. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, it talks about there in verse 14, Ephesians 4:14, 4, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So there's that deception of Satan and his ministers trying to deceive us with false doctrine. We also know that our flesh, according to Jeremiah 17, 9, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So you've got the flesh being deceitful. You've got Satan and his lie program being deceitful. Well, how do you combat that? In the next verse, Ephesians 4, 15. Ephesians 4, 15 but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Uh, what I appreciate about this group that we have, and I think it was mentioned earlier about the Lenny and Lisa's fellowship yesterday, you see the love of Christ coming through this group more than any other group I've been a part of. Not to say that other groups don't have that, but just what I've seen myself, I see that more through this group. Uh, the love of Christ coming through, and it's not just love that will get you through, but also you got to speak the truth in love. And so that's where it comes in. The way you combat the deceitfulness of Satan's lie program and the deceitfulness of your own flesh is to get the truth of God's word and you speak it in love and that will overcome. So, thank you, Richard. Appreciate the comment. Yeah, yeah Lenny and Lisa, they really help out a lot. 
I mean, they bring this thing together. They, 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 there's a lot of love coming from that house. And, and, uh, uh, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Lenny and Lisa. Anyhow, yeah, thank you, Eric. Thanks, Richard. Go ahead, Lisa. It's just so precious, Richard, for you to say that, and Eric, because it is God's love. It's God's love in us coming through us to others. We do love the body of Christ so sincerely. And uh, we do have our flesh, so please pray for us, <laughs> because uh, the war can be on at times, but the Word of God is amazing. When that flesh wants to be in control, man, you think about Scripture, it gets less and less. I praise God for that. But but we are we are grateful to be part of this body of Christ. And um, I, Eric, I have a quick question, and then we're going to be in and out the house in case you call on us and I don't answer. But uh, when all the sons of God came and rejoiced when God created the foundation of the earth, was Satan among the sons of God that rejoiced? Do we know that? That was before he fell, right? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, he was the anointed cherub that covers God's throne. Uh, we know from Ezekiel 28, it mentions that he was in Eden. Um, and Ezekiel 28 and verse 13, it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And it mentions the sardis, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Well, the question is, when was iniquity found in Satan? Well, Isaiah 14 tells you it's basically when he came up with this plan. The five I will statements in Isaiah 14, uh, verses 12 through 14. Uh, well, it says in verse 13, Isaiah 14, verse 13, Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will send, ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, the Most High in Genesis 14 is defined for you in Genesis, uh, let's see, 14 verse 19. Genesis 14 verse 19, you've got Melchizedek blessing Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. So the term Most High God seems to be correlated, because that's the, the law of the first use. The Most High God means possessor of heaven and earth. And so if he says in Isaiah 14, verse 14, if Lucifer says, I will be like the Most High, to me that means he says, I am going to possess heaven and earth. So to me, what that means is that Satan probably, or Lucifer probably fell after heaven and earth were created. Uh, because he says, when he fell, the iniquity was found in him when he came with these five I will statements. And one of the I will statements is, I will be like the Most High. And the Most High is the possessor of heaven and earth. So for him to say, I want to possess heaven and earth, heaven and earth must have existed already. And so I think when Ezekiel 28 mentions in verse 13, he had been in Eden, the garden of God, you notice he has all this covering on him. So I think what happened was he saw, he saw man uh, made. You know from uh, Psalm 8, when, when it talks about when God made man, it says uh, in verse 5, uh, Psalm 8 verse 5, that God made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So I think when God made heaven and earth and then he made man at the end, he gave man 
the, would be basically the one who would have dominion. God would have to be the possessor of heaven and earth, but man would have dominion over heaven and earth. And that's because the building is Christ. He's the foundation of God's building in heaven and earth. And so, um, and it's the man Christ Jesus who is going to ultimately be the one who possesses heaven and earth. So I think what Satan did, or Lucifer did, because Ezekiel 28 says he sealeth up the sum, perfect in wisdom and beauty. So I think Satan, or Lucifer, used his wisdom, and when he saw man created, and that God possessed heaven and earth, but gave dominion of heaven and earth over to man, then Satan, or Lucifer, says, I can corrupt man, and then I will be the possessor of heaven and earth. I will be like the Most High. So I do think, in answer to your question, in Job 38, when it says, um, all the sons of God, uh, verse Job 38, verse 7, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, uh, it says all of them there, and the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God. Um, and, you know, Lucifer is called, uh, Isaiah 14, he is called Isaiah 14 and verse 12, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Not the morning star. Morning star is Jesus, but he is son of the morning. So uh, I would say that Job 38, 7, when all the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, I think that Lucifer was one of those. I don't think he had fallen yet. I think uh, they shouted for joy when Christ has made the, the cornerstone and uh, say, okay, this plan is going to work. It's going to be great. And then it's uh, after that that God makes uh, Adam, gives dominion, makes Adam and gives dominion of the earth to Adam. And then uh, Satan says, aha, you know, Jesus Christ, I know, you know, I can't do anything against him, but Adam, I can get him to go against me and then I can be possessor of heaven and earth. So I think that... Uh, yeah, Job 38, 7, I think that included Lucifer. I don't think he had sinned yet. I think he sins afterward. Yeah. It's so sad to think of that, that in the beginning of creation, when God created the heavens and the earth, and Jesus Christ was the chief cornerstone, that he shouted for joy. It's just so sad to think. At that moment, he shouted for joy. But then, when he saw Adam and Eve, like you explained, jealousy, evil, whatever, it's just... To me, that's heartbreaking. That it, at the beginning, he shouted for joy, and then he, he, he sinned and he fell, and it just breaks my heart because that's where it all started. <laughs> yeah, right. But God has redeemed us from all of that through his precious son, the blood of his precious son. Yeah, and, and Lucifer was... Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you for today. It was, it was just awesome. Yeah, Lucifer was... I mean, he's the anointed cherub that covers God's throne. He's the worship leader of heaven with the instruments within him. He seals up the sum of the wisdom and the beauty. Uh, I mean, until you get to man, Lucifer is the, the greatest creation of, of God, it seems like, based upon what we know, at least. I mean, seraphim, we don't really know much about them. Perhaps they're greater, I don't know. But it, it seems like, he, from the text, that Lucifer was created as the best one. And, uh, and he was even above them because the angels you know it's from psalm 8 when man god made man uh we were made a little lower than the angels so even though god gave dominion of the earth and the heaven to man uh, as far as power and everything we're lower than the angels and satan isn't an angel but he's a cherub and he was a probably the highest ranking one so i, I think he looks at it and says well i've got more power than these men and so I can take over. So it was all that pride. But because also another part is, um, he's the anointed cherub that covers God's throne. So you think of it, and I'm not good at drawing, but you think of the throne, and you got the four cherubs on each side. Ezekiel 1 talks about that. But then on top of the throne, there's that fifth cherub. There's Satan. He's covering the throne. Well, if you look over in Revelation chapter 4, Remember, also from Ezekiel thirty, uh, Ezekiel twenty-eight, it said that he was he seals up the sum of uh, Ezekiel twenty-eight, verse twelve. 
Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So it seems like Lucifer was created as the, the, the powerful and most beautiful creation of God up until that point. And then man is given dominion over heaven and earth, but they don't have the power of the angels. And Satan is even, or Lucifer is even, has more since he's a cherub. And he covers God's throne. Well, he covers God's throne, and he is perfect in beauty. Or well, Revelation chapter 4, uh, let's see. Uh, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2. Revelation 4 verse 2. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardin stone. So this is referring to Jesus Christ. He's sitting on that throne in heaven. It says, there was a rainbow round about the throne, and sight like unto an emerald. Okay, that's not what I was looking for. Uh, maybe it's Revelation 5. Uh... Maybe, wait a minute. Around the throne, 24 elders, seats, seven spirits of God. Okay, verse 6. Okay, here it is. Revelation 4, verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, four full of eyes before and behind. That's the four cherubs. So you got the four cherubs around that throne. Then you got the fifth cherub, the anointed cherub that covers God's throne, Lucifer, on top. So if he is perfect in beauty, Ezekiel 28 says, and then he's looking down to protect the throne, and around the throne is a sea of glass, then what may have happened is that Lucifer sees his own reflection in the sea of glass and says, I am the most beautiful creature around, and I'm the most powerful, therefore, I'm going to take over, I'm going to become God. And I think that's where his pride comes in. He's walking by sight and not by faith, and he says, look at me, look at how beautiful I am. I mean, I see myself under this mirror, this sea of glass, this reflection coming up. And so then when he sins, when he sins, then he would lose his, you know, he's... Uh, he would lose that, that uh, beauty that he had. He would no longer be the most beautiful creature. Just like Adam, I mean, God clothed himself with light, and then when Adam, he had light, he was naked and unashamed. But then when he sinned, Genesis 3, he loses the clothing of light. Now he's ashamed. He's trying to cover himself up. It's interesting that when you read in Ezekiel 28, when it says that Lucifer had been in the garden of God, and it says in verse 13, so you think of Lucifer having probably a beautiful clothing of light as well. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but it seems like he probably did. Uh, if he is uh, a, the most beautiful creature that God had made, physically speaking. Uh, so he sees his reflection in that sea of glass, and he says, well, I'm going to become God. Look at, I've got the wisdom, I've got the power, and I've got the looks. I've got everything, you know. Beauty and brains, who can beat that, you know? So he says, I am going to become God. I'm going to be the possessor of heaven and earth. Um, but then he falls, so then he probably loses that clothing of light, just like um, Adam did. Well, he lost his, so he was naked and unashamed. Uh, but then he loses, he sins, and now he's ashamed. So then he goes and sews fig leaves together. But notice the description of Satan in Eden here in Ezekiel 28, verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. So I think what happens is Satan loses his glory that he has due to him sinning. And so then he decides, well, I've lost my clothing of light. No big deal. I'll create my own clothing of light. And that's why he, he clothes himself in all of these precious stones. Because, you know, precious stones, what's beautiful about them is that when the sun reflects off of them, they show that the light. And, you know, different stones have different colors. You know, red or green or black or gold or whatever it is. They all have different colors. And so what, say, what Satan does is he loses his light because he sins. And so then he comes up with his own covering here 
of all these different colors of these different precious stones to reflect the light. So he says, hey, no big deal. I'm still going to be possessor of heaven and earth. I don't need God's clothing of light. I got my own clothing of light. And he puts all these stones on. And I think that's also why the, uh, the homosexuals use a rainbow as their flag because now that's their covering. It's they lose their clothing of light because they're given over to a reprobate mind. So then they say, yeah, no problem. Satan says, I'll give you a clothing of light just like I have. Here's your light. Here's your colors. Here's the rainbow. So um, anyway, yeah, so that was all extra. But yeah, yeah, basically it's uh, Job 38. I think he rejoiced, but then he, it was due to his pride and seeing his own beauty and his wisdom and his power. And part of that is looking, instead of protecting the throne like he should have done, is he's looking at the sea of glass and saying, hey, I look pretty good. I, I can overtake this and become the one sitting on the throne myself. So I think that's where his downfall is. But you're right, it's just such a sad thing. I mean, a lot of times we think of Satan as the bad guy, which, I mean, he certainly is. But, you know, God loved him. God loves everybody. I mean, God didn't want that to happen for him. So, I mean, it's, it was, uh, I'm sure it was a difficult thing for God to see that happen. Um, he knew it would happen, but it's still, uh, and it's so, yeah, it's really sad to see that God would make such a beautiful creature, sealing up perfect in wisdom and beauty, sealing up the sum, and then look at what he's become now. It's, it's just uh, sad that it would come down to that. Uh, I know you got to go pretty soon. Did you have anything else, Lisa? Eric, thank you for that wonderful explanation. At the end, will you, um, I have one more question. Will you wait to the end, and because I want other people to go, in 1 Peter 1, 1, why were the believing remnant, why were they called strangers? I know they were scattered throughout, but the, first, the word strangers, um, I'm just curious about that. So, oh, it's just because they don't live in, they're not natives of that country. Oh, they're strangers Stran in the stranger, okay. Strangers are sort of like a foreigner. Uh, you, know, okay. you could say that someone who moves here from, say, China would be a, in that context, would be a stranger in the United States. They're a foreigner. They're not okay. native, natural-born citizen, that type of thing. So. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. That was an easy one, a good one. Thank you, yeah. Eric. Thanks, Lisa. Thank Thanks, Lenny. We love you. Have a great Thank rest you. of your day. Love you. love you, too. Thanks for all you do. Amen. Karen, Karen, did you have a question or comment? I just have a comment. Um, this has been a great, great lesson today. Um, you know, we are we are admonished so many times by our Apostle Paul not to be deceived, um, to not be ignorant, and and all of that. And today's lesson, to me, is just an example of bringing us into more knowledge of the truth, because. You brought out so many wonderful things, and and Richard said something to kind of enforce that you have to know the truth um, to to recognize the lie. You have to know the truth to recognize the lie. And um, I don't know; it was probably maybe three or four weeks ago on our lady study. One of the ladies that gets on, she she shared a book that she had gotten from. Um, Forgotten Truths, Richard Jordan's uh, website. And I'm a kind of a book nut, so I had to turn around and order the book because, you know, I felt like I had to have it. But it's called Satan and His Plan of Evil. By Satan Keith. and His Plan It's by Keith Blades? Yes. Everything that you just explained to Lisa is in the very beginning of this book. I don't recommend... You know, I have people that ask me, well, this is going to be a year of personal growth and all this kind of stuff. What is some suggested reading material? And I just tell them Romans through Philemon in your King James Bible. <coughs> you want to grow personally and any in every way, read that. You Amen. don't have to invest in another book. So, But I do like to read, and I like to educate myself in that way. But every single thing... And he has a really uh, a, a nice, in the back of it, he has a nice chart, the right division chart. It's written, it's the same as the other one, but he just goes into some deeper explanation there on the bottom and in the back. So it's really a great, a great tool. 
and I'm just in the beginning of this, but when you were talking to Lisa, it you were the five I will statements uh, there. It goes over all of that. It was just amazing to me how like clockwork, tick, tick, tick. So not only do we need to know the truth, we need to know this too. We need to know the enemy, the adversary. Because uh, if we don't, then we're likely to be deceived by some of that form of godliness, some of the things that are in the live program. I'm very excited about the, the conference coming up in March uh, because that's just going to be furtherance of that, I believe. And I thank you for today, and I thank you for going in the depth and detail that you do uh, to answer our questions, to since you started using the, the whiteboard behind you, it has been awesome. The notes that we've been able to take because of that have just increased so dramatically. And it helps us when we're able to share with other people that you do that. So thank you for what you do. And um, it's life-changing. And so what you do is, is help us come into the knowledge of the truth. And I'm very grateful for that. So thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good recommended book, um, Satan and the Plan of Evil by Keith Blades. Satan and His Plan of Evil by Keith Blades. Um, I first learned right division as a teenager, and then I found when I found John Verstegen's church, that was probably oh, about 16, 17 years ago, I guess, and that was the book that was recommended to me. I didn't really know about Stam and Richard Jordan and J.C. O'Hare and all that I didn't, and I had really read books that people had read, written, but uh, that was one of the books recommended to me. And I like um, Satan and the Plan of Evil because it will give you. I think it shows you, it does that comparison between the truth and the lie program. Uh, a lot of times, the danger. Like another book that was recommended to me was C.R. Stam's uh, Things That Differ, and I read both of those books, and they're both good. Uh, I'd recommend you know both of them, but. Um, what I liked about, the thing about Stam's book is that you've got a lot of like what we're doing on Tuesday night. You see, okay, here's Israel's program, here's the body of Christ. And so you can see the differences, you can see the things that differ, and you say, okay, I need to rightly divide the word of truth. But when you, what the thing about Keith's book is that it's Satan's plan versus God's plan, basically. And you see where Satan's coming from and what he's doing, and so then you can see then why you need to rightly divide the word of truth and why it makes sense. And so uh, that was a real good book because a lot of times when it comes to right division, we don't really look at Satan. We look at what God is doing. And that's fine, but it, I, I think it, it'll help you a lot. You can identify the lie program of Satan more so through that book because you learn of his... You know, Paul says um, that regarding Satan, we are not ignorant of his devices. And so if you know what he's doing in his plan... His plan of evil, then you can, that lie program, then you can see, okay, I know his devices, I know what he's doing, and so then I can combat it with the truth. So, yeah, I would, I'd recommend that too. That's a very good book. Uh, appreciate your comment, Karen. Thank you. Uh, David Dejan, David Dejan, did you have a question or comment? You can unmute yourself. not be right by your phone. Um, uh, David, if you're away but you want to come back later, you can just show your video and we'll, I'll get back to you then. But uh, maybe you had to step away. Um, I would go to Kitty, but I think, I don't know if she's right there either. I give her a chance too. Kitty, you can, uh, oh, there you are. <laughs> I saw the ceiling. <laughs> you can unmute yourself if you want. In the lower, you have to unmute uh, in the lower left-hand corner, there should be that uh, microphone button down there. You can click on that to unmute. Uh, yeah, you're you're muted. I can't hear you. I don't know. Oh, oh there you go. There you go. Right. Excuse me. I, can I just say ditto? That'll save you a lot of time. Just <laughs> ditto. What everybody said fit in perfectly with uh, my thought process. The only thing I do not, I'm not able to read um, what you write. 
you know, in order to take notes, I'm, I'm not able to do that. Uh, but I, um, it, 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 you explain it so well that I just write down what I think will, well, I always write the scriptures down. I'll, so I have that. And when I have that, if I listen to it, if I uh, listen to it again and follow through, I'm able to get a real good comprehension of what you're saying. And I just appreciate you dearly. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you, Kitty. Thank you, Kitty. Praise the Lord. I, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Does anybody else have anything before I go to Jerry? Okay, Jerry, you want to wrap it up for us? Yes, thank you, Eric. Great teaching. Thank you for the uh, time you put in. Uh, it's really appreciated. I'd like to read. Um, I was seeing something here that caught my eye and made me think about when Jesus was on the cross. He said, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they do. And then... Uh, uh, Stephen at the uh, end of chapter 7 of Acts and he said lay not this to their charge interesting uh, with Jesus comment uh, Israel was given one year of mercy Luke 13 9 through 6 I think it is up in there. but then uh, and then when Stephen made his comment the wrath didn't come, but now 2,000 years of grace. And Paul, and uh, if this has any connection, it does to me a little bit. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Jerry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'm a little way. I'm a little way from the mic. Um, in Second Timothy, chapter four, as he's writing his last letter up, uh, writing, finishing it up, and he says in 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me. At 2 Timothy 4, 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me. But all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. <laughs> and it's kind of similar to what Christ said and uh, Stephen said at the end of their life. And uh, 17, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me and by me, the preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the line. And we continue now these 2,000 years from my apostle saying that, and we've been given grace and mercy to continue doing the work of the Father through Jesus Christ in us. And uh, thank God we have reached this point in our journey to be saved in such a, a great way that we understand nothing can separate us from the love of God. So thank you, Eric, for continuing. Yeah, thanks, Jerry, for bringing that out. Um, yeah, I had met, I had seen before about Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, and, and Stephen, uh, Lord, lay not this into their charge. And I saw the connection there, but uh, I never really thought about <clears throat> what you mentioned there in 2 Timothy 4.16, uh, be not late to their charge. And that, that that's a good one. One thing that we need to understand, I think, is, and, and I've seen this too, especially I've had people that attack me because of the doctrine that I teach is against what they believe. Uh, but yet, yeah. and but later on, maybe, they come back around. And they'll say, you know, that it's like they, you, people have that built up in their conscience and they don't want to go against that and they, they feel like you're attacking uh, what God's Word says when you're really given the truth of God's Word, but it's built up in their conscience wrong. And a lot of times there is that, um, I think the reason you got that forgiveness there when you are confronted with that error is because people are, like we've been talking about, they're so deceived. Um, there are so many, I mean, you look at, you probably go to any church out there, any fundamental part of churchianity today, and it is filled with good, sincere people who honestly think that they are attempting at least to follow God and His Word. And they believe that, that, that going to that church is 
uh, going toward that goal of following God and His Word. I would say the vast, vast majority of people who attend fundamental churchianity have that goal in mind. I mean, I go to these Southern Gospel concerts. You don't have right dividers there. You can see people. I mean, they, they read God's Word. They, they go to church and they have that desire. They're just deceived and they don't know it. And it reminds me of this verse. Um, and what You're in 2 Timothy. Well, if you look in 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 through 26. Okay. 2 Timothy 2, 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. I'd say the vast majority of fundamental churchianity are doing the best they can to follow God and his word, but they are in the snare of the devil, they are doing his will, and they don't even know it. Verse 25 yeah. says that they, they oppose themselves. And so I think that's where, you know, what Richard talked about and what we've been talking about, the deception program of Satan's lie program, the deception of your flesh. I mean, there's just so many people out there that are deceived into thinking the lies are the truth. And so there is this compassion. He's basically saying, be gentle on them all men, have to teach, patient, be meek. Because he said, recognize basically most, I'd say most of churchianity is ensnared by the devil. And they don't even know it. And so I think that's where Paul comes in. You know, like, like with Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You go to Acts 2, and Peter says, well, you did this out of ignorance. You didn't know you were doing that. You didn't know you were crucifying your Messiah. You did it out of ignorance. Then they stoned Stephen. They committed blasphemy of the Holy Ghost there. They didn't know they did it. So he says, Lord... Lay not this sin to their charge. And so what you just mentioned there, 2 Timothy 4, 16, it's interesting that this is at the end of Paul's life. And he said earlier in that book, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. And he doesn't say, good riddance, I'm glad I rid of them. No, he says, basically, I pray that God that it may not be laid to their charge. Because I can tell you, there are many sincere Christians going to heaven who go to church every single Sunday, love the Lord, read their Bible, and believe that they are doing God's will when they're really ensnared by the devil, imposing them, opposing themselves, and they don't even know it. And so I think a lot of us, you know, we need to recognize that deception program of the devil, and it's so in our flesh, and... Uh, and so have the attitude that Paul had. Even at the end of his life, when all men forsook him and all those in Asia be turned away from him, yet he says, lay it not to their charge. In other words, give them another chance because I know that they just oppose themselves. They're in the snare of the devil and they don't even realize it. And so I think that's a good lesson for us to take from today is to recognize, you know, if, if someone rejects right division, obviously you can't shove it down their throats and get them to believe it. But at the same time, don't give up on them. Keep praying for them. And you never know the opportunity that may come up later in life. You just never know. I mean, Richard um, shared right division with his son, with his uh, friend Dino, years ago when he learned it. He didn't believe it. Well, he had a lot of other things going on in his life. And here, a couple weeks ago, he contacted me. We find out he's in right division for eight years. I mean, you, you never know what's going to happen. It's people may be... You know, they got that heart for God, but they're just deceived and don't know it. And they got all this cares of this world or the things, warfare going on, spiritually speaking, and they don't recognize what's going on. But keep praying for them, looking for those opportunities, and you just never know somewhere down the road uh, that they may believe right division and get sound doctrine and get out of that snare of the devil. So I think Paul recognizes that, and so he prays that it uh, not, not, may not be laid to their charge. So. I appreciate you sharing that, Jerry. I think that's a good way of closing yeah, it's really it together. good. Thank you, Eric. And uh, on David Dijon, I don't know if he's there, but when he does, help me try to remember to, but he knows a lot of people in New Orleans where uh, 
Bill Ainsworth stations is at. Maybe he could, uh, if David being in business, he may know some uh, bookkeeper that could uh, help Bill run his station. So mm -hmm. just to see if uh, we get David to take a look at that. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, that would be good. It'd be a shame if that station doesn't operate anymore because of that. So, yeah, it'd be good to keep that station alive and getting the truth out there. All right, anybody have anything else before we say goodbye? All right, well, thanks, everybody, for joining. Have a good day, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow night. We'll be in Judges tomorrow night. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, -bye. Bye, Bye everybody.